Welcome to Idea Collider, a regular podcast hosted by me, Mike Rea, uh, where I speak with the people who I regard as the most interesting within the pharmaceutical space, or I talk with the authors of the books that I've found most interesting on the subject of innovation. So, uh, enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Idea Collider. I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Kabir Nath to the uh, to the podcast. I've known Kabir for a while in, in a couple of different companies, um, and I know that you'll enjoy listening to some of his insights on big companies, small companies, on innovation, and uh, and more. So, Kabir, welcome to the welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Mike, and it's a real pleasure to join you. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Maybe it's always useful. Could you tell us, you know, your journey from you know, university to, to, to where you sit today? I'm happy to do that. And I think, unlike some of your other guests, it's probably a bit more serendipitous um, in my case. So I have a maths degree, which is really of no use for anything, <laughs> um, and came out of university spent a few years working in consultancy, not actually for your favorite consultant, McKinsey, um, but for Booz Allen and a spin out from Booz Allen, and then went to do an MBA. And, you know, neither of us probably want to think back that far, but there was a time in the early 90s that it was a recession in the UK. And I was really looking for, you know, the right role who wanted a, a, a freshly minted MBA who knew nothing about anything. And I was lucky enough to land at a venerable British company called Smith and Nephew which still very much exists as a leading med tech company. And even then, while the focus was med tech, it had a bit of everything. It had consumer and a whole range of things and so on. And over the next 11 years, had an extraordinary series of opportunities there. Uh, I'd been there a couple of years when they decided to re-enter India. So I was sent to India with a sheet of paper that said, Smith and Nephew's re-entry strategy for India at the top and was blank for the next couple of sides. So spent a couple of fascinating years in Mumbai, getting our business back from a distributor, setting up third party manufacturing and so on. And this was all before I turned 30. So I clearly had no idea what I was doing, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, spent a few more years in Asia, still with Smith and Nephew, and then came back to London in 2000 and did roles in strategy and BD. And that's where you know I'd been lucky enough to get to run businesses at a young age. Uh, and then spent a couple of years doing deals. And really that was the point where Smith and Nephew went from this kind of unfocused conglomerate to something that was much more focused around what is still today's business, orthopedics, wound management, and so on. I like running businesses and I like kind of the opportunity to get into the PL and so on. And Bristol Myers Squibb came calling. Ironically, I knew the device parts of Bristol. I knew Zimmer, which had recently been sold off. I knew Convertech. Um, I guess it shows I knew almost nothing about pharmaceuticals that I joined Bristol Myers Squibb in 2003. But I did actually back out in Asia, uh, spent the next five or six years, both in Singapore and in China. And actually running Bristol in China was one of my really formative experiences. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done professionally and personally. But I was extraordinarily lucky because I arrived to run China at relatively short notice when we were about five months ahead of the approval of a drug called Entecavir or Baraclube, which was a game changer in hepatitis B. Um, was, still is an amazing drug, um, highly potent, essentially minimal, zero resistance even over time, and therefore a significant change from the then standard of care. And I was in China with 90 million people living with chronic hepatitis B. And there was a bunch of things that needed fixing in the business. But I basically said to everyone in the team, if we can't make a success of this, nobody in this company from me down deserves a job. We should all be fired if we can't make this successful. And really created that yeah. sense of crisis and a burning platform around that. Yeah. And you know, we were incredibly successful. We went on to be really successful in the launch of that. And a number of things have stuck with me from that time. I mean, first, that need for intense focus around a particular aim, the aspiration around that. A second, which was fascinating about China, and which I think I've tried to take with me also going forwards, is there really wasn't very much data. 
I mean, compared to today in the US market, where you have, frankly, too much data about everything, we had very little data. So we had to actually go out and find our own. So we literally, you know, MSLs didn't really exist in China, but we created the precursor to MSLs and they went and asked physicians how many people they were treating, what, you know, all these things and so on. And we really built that. And I think, you know, learning that you have to make judgment calls in the absence of information or with ambiguous information or with only a few signals, that's something really valuable you get from working in all these different markets. Eventually, I knew that if I wanted to stay at Bristol, I'd come to the mothership. So I did. I moved to Princeton in 2009, spent uh, the next five or six years at Bristol, um, again, doing a variety of different roles, including riding the whole roller coaster of Bristol's entry into hepatitis C, which you know could be the subject of another mm -hmm. um, session, because that was very, very interesting. I, I, was, I was hoping to come back to it. All right. Well, we we can certainly. And um, as as everyone knows, Bristol is essentially an oncology company, and really had pivoted towards that. And though I've worked across multiple specialty areas, I've never actually worked in oncology. So it was time to uh, think about doing something different. I'm incredibly grateful for the experiences I had there. I mean, it's classic big pharma in what it was 13, 14 years. I don't know how many different jobs in three different countries and so on. So all those experiences that you could only get in you know, really big, very well-run global companies. But it was time for something different. And I came to Otsuka five years ago. So when I arrived, sales had essentially fallen by between 70 and 80%. And I've had a wonderful journey in the last five years of you know, helping to rebuild Otsuka, not only in its core psychiatry areas, which remain fundamental to us, and I'm sure we'll talk more about mental health and where I see the future of psychiatry, but also we had the opportunity to launch into polycystic kidney disease with the first and only drug approved there. And that, again, I took some of those lessons from China, which is, you know, create not exactly a sense of crisis, but a sense of opportunity of just, just how big could this be? If, if that was our only asset, you know, there are companies built around something much less valuable than that, where everyone is just focused on that. And we were able to create that sense of urgency and excitement. And that's been a very successful launch as well. So here I find myself, you know, um, having grown up in the UK, um, running the US subsidiary of a Japanese pharmaceutical company and living in New Jersey. And I, I can tell you, none of that would I have predicted 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. But that's what's fun about life and careers. Interesting, because because you started that with saying, unlike other guests on the podcast, actually, the theme of serendipity has been a remarkable one. You know, and I, I always talk about, you know, serendipity being different than luck, because of the the opportunity spotting part of it, you know, and uh, so I'd be interested, do you, you know, how, how important do you feel like the range of experience that you've had, you know, can be brought to, you know, your evaluation of a situation today? Do, do you think that's a critical part or? I, I think it certainly helps. I think, so I think a couple of things. I think working in lots of different markets and cultures, including working in places where I don't speak the language, Mm -hmm. forces you to be much more reservant because in the end, you know, how we get work done is through human beings and how we interact with other human beings and how we lead and influence others. So that has made me much more observant. I know my time in Asia, I became, I mean, I still talk too much, but I, I became somebody who used fewer words and fewer sentences because it was important to convey meaning and so on in that sense. So I think in terms of reading situations, being able to make judgment calls based on, frankly, ambiguous or not necessarily congruent signals. Um, really, I, I, I see, and just the experience of kind of orchestrating, bringing people together from very diverse backgrounds, cultures, sets of interests, and so on. Absolutely. I think that stood me in good stead. And, you know, it means, of course, I have a bias for recruiting people with similar backgrounds, but we all have those different biases. Yeah, and uh, I suspect the China that you were uh, you know, that you landed in is a very different China than the China today. So that must have been a very interesting scenario. I, yeah, I mean, it's it's nearly 20 years ago. And so what I remind people is that in terms of today's pharmaceutical market and environment in China, I know absolutely nothing because it clearly has changed. And yeah, I mean, this was this was the Wild West in terms of, you know, from a regulatory point of view, from a distribution and pricing perspective and so on. And so, yeah, you you grow up fast when you're managing something in China. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that kind of, um, it's, it's interesting, you essentially describe a sort of skunk works approach to getting stuff done, you've got to build it, 
in order for it to to, to, to happen. So um, I think that skill probably has served you well. Uh, I mean, at least with your degree in maths, I suspect that the maths is still true today. You know, my <laughs> my, my degree in genetics from all that time ago, I suspect nothing that I learned right. is still true. So uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, so how would you kind of see, you know, you've got a wide perspective on the industry. How would you see, you know, has it changed for the better over that time? Has it changed for the worse over that time? You know, how, how would you characterize the changes? So I, I think what we do fundamentally as an industry is extraordinary and continues to be extraordinary. So I'm lucky enough to have worked in HIV, in hepatitis C at the time when we got these all oral cures. And, you know, and I think if you, the way I think about that is if you look back even 10 years ago or 12 years ago, you know, we didn't know that oral cures for HCV were possible. Immuno-oncology didn't exist. Gene therapies certainly didn't exist. mRNA certainly wasn't being used in any commercially viable product. You know, it was very much a, you know, a thought among a few scientists at that time. So I think you know, what we do and continue to do as an industry is truly extraordinary. And that I know, you know, motivates, drives all of us to continue to do that. The circumstances and environment in which we do it is pretty challenging. Um, there's no two ways about that. And I think, you know, and maybe it's easier for me to say this as somebody who came to the U.S., you know, relatively later in life and so on. I mean, we talk about a healthcare system in this country. The word system it really kind of needs to be an in inverted commas because a system implies something that actually works in a coordinated fashion with kind of levers pulling in the same direction. That's clearly not true in the US. We have a whole series of completely misaligned incentives. We have far too many players and we've ended up with a delivery of healthcare that is incredibly bureaucratic, where we seem to pay as much for administration as for actual medicine and is very much a sick care system as opposed to a healthcare, let alone a wellness system. And you know, I, I, I've spent most of my time in the US right now, and so that's kind of a focus. But I think you know, globally, there are all sorts of different challenges. And you know, we almost, well, we certainly should have thought harder about access from a global perspective before now. I think you're seeing right now with the vaccines that we have, you know, gross inequities within countries, across countries, across continents, and so on. So what I would say is this is still the most amazing industry to work in, the most amazing place to be, but we had to be cognizant of the size of some of these challenges. And I think as leaders, we have to turn to some of these newer challenges that we haven't actually necessarily articulated so well before. Yeah. And and do you see some of those things like the inequity, like the you know, diversity, inclusion, exclusion is 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 some of the key drivers of change within the industry? They have to be. I, I, I think they have to be. I mean, I think, you know, and, but, you know, and it's, but there are several dimensions. I mean, first, you know, as employers, we've got to fix our houses. Yes. I mean, we have to actually start intentionally within our companies. You have to start to build workforces and capabilities that are more reflective of the real world. And then, you know, Obviously, there's a lot of focus around clinical trials and the fact that clinical trials today recruit from, frankly, pretty narrow segments of population, you know, urban populations with easy access to academic centers, whatever, and so on. And then, of course, where do the medicines actually go and so on? And I think, you know, particularly as a company with a strong focus in psychiatry and mental health, um, you know, you have to be humble enough to recognize that social, environmental, and all sorts of other determinants are so key to how a patient's journey with mental illness plays out that absolutely we have to address that. And no, we, you know, we and the we as a collective, we, we haven't done a good enough job of that historically, and we have to drive towards that. No, it's an interesting point. I remember Bob, or Bob Oliver at, uh, at Osuga to describing his experience within a you know, within a hospital where people with, you know, you know, mental health issues were being managed and actually his observation of you know, some of the small things that you would never get from market research that you have to get by being there and seeing, you know, how care is delivered and, and so forth. Uh, clearly, it's something that Otsuka takes very seriously. You have to acknowledge that the drug is only a very small part of the patient's journey towards better outcomes. And, 
it's complex, it involves typically caregivers and family members and so on as well. But also, unfortunately, people with mental illness tend to have often very difficult or unfortunate interactions with the system, whether that's the hospital mm. system, whether that's, frankly, the criminal justice system as well. Mm. Interesting. On the hepatitis C scenario, because I still think it's one of the most interesting case studies of recent times, uh, you know, drugs that... Um, you know, the survival behalf only drugs that Roche had for free and that, you know, every, everyone else um, was keen on having, you know, how, how comfortable do you feel describing the, you know, the world from within Bristol Myers Group at that time? Uh, no, I'm happy to, you know, so Bristol was, um, you know, we, we were actually the very first company to demonstrate, you know, after Roche had done those early studies out in, uh, I think, Australia, that, um, you know, an all oral cure was possible. And I remember, I think it was easel in 2010 or 11, where it was a small numbers, but we actually demonstrated that and so on. And I think obviously, a number of companies at that time started to get aggressively into that space and so on. And I think, you know, clearly, the acquisition of Pharmacet was the defining moment um, in that, you know, series of development paradigms and so on. And, you know, Gilead needed to do it, and they did. Um, it's a matter of record that you know BMS went out thereafter to buy a nuke immediately after that, and unfortunately that didn't work out. Um, you know, I think what we can be proud of is we still managed to get the first regimen into Japan, so we were able to actually you know get um, a, a decent business out of Japan. And declatosphere as the NS5A was at the heart of a certain number of regimens until, of course, you know, Savaldi came along and essentially, and therefore BMS was out of that business. But, you know, a couple of things to think about that. I mean, there was, you know, there was an element of luck and serendipity around all of that. Um, I think there was an element of, you know, it really was too good to be true. I mean, none of us could quite believe that you know, we weren't needing 24 or 48 weeks of interferon. As you'll recall, all the first orals were studied with interferon. Yes, yeah. they were studied yes. with in those lengthy trials and so on. And you know, just the idea that we could move this paradigm to, you know, a, a, a single tablet for eight weeks, I think mm. that was, I mean, it was amazing. And it, it still is amazing. Mm. I think what's the after side of that story, though, is, you know, Hepatitis C was really the opportunity to say, this is a public health issue. This is not about how do we make money. This is a public health issue where we could solve a public health issue if we could really have the appropriate public-private partnerships, world repairs, and so on. And the tragedy is we still haven't done that. We still haven't solved HCV as a public health issue. You know, We have cured some folks with access to care of HCV, but we actually haven't done what we could have done with that. But still a fascinating story from you know, from a both a development and a commercialization perspective. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, I think I saw some statistics recently on just how few of the addressable population, you know, have you know benefited from that cure, um, which, you know, in light of COVID, you, you feel was a sort of remarkable contrast, right? Isn't it? Well, and you know, and this is where again, you, you know, look, um, we we absolutely depend on patents for the lifeblood of our industry and so on, and that's essential. That you know, the innovation we do is recognised and protected, and I do strongly believe that. But of course, the challenge is many of the HCV patents still have years to run. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. I mean it's, and that's yeah. So again, and that's you know, it comes back to, to your earlier question about you know the environment we work in. I think it's questions like this. That we've got to be more prepared as industry leaders to start to address. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so, on, you know, I think the Savaldi one was one of disruptive innovation, you know, which we don't often get in in, in spaces. So, I guess, I guess the interesting thing is, you know, what what would you think of, you know, if you had your time again, or the things that you would do to predict the scenario running differently, or is it uh, is it just the way that organisations struggle to see, you know, radical change happening? I, I think it's um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I I think sometimes you do see it and can jump onto it, and sometimes you don't. So I mean, you know, at the same time in BMS, you know, BMS, you know, got into immune oncology and clearly led the development of that field. Yes, and again, saw things that nobody else had seen 
you know, with the acquisition of Metarex and so on, and was able to very quickly parlay that into something significant. So I think it's, you know, and I think you're right, it's partly your starting point. I mean, for Gilead with a mature HIV franchise, you know, their need was different. Um, so I think yeah. it's also, you know, it depends on on how you how you frame your need from the starting point. And that's, as you know, because you spent a lot of time thinking about that, yeah, that framing, that framing of the need, that framing of the questions you need to ask is fundamental. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the thing about who you are makes a difference to the decisions that you make. Absolutely. Uh, your context, your your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now be, so on, you know, if we focus on innovation as a sort of specific discipline, do you have a, do you have a definition of innovation that you work to? We don't, but you know, for me, what's critical, and I'm not going to talk really about research and discovery because that's clearly a, a fundamental area, but that doesn't fall under me. And we largely manage that out of Japan within Otsuka. You know, to me, innovation is essentially the the art of getting to better outcomes for our patients more quickly, more efficiently, and so on. And to me, anything that can really do that. And ideally in ways that others haven't thought about or haven't thought about yet, that to me is, is how I think about innovation. And so, you know, it, it it should and needs to apply across the entire spectrum. And, you know, some of it is, you know, if we look at clinical development, clinical trials, you know, biggest single cost driver for many of us from, you know, from a practical perspective, then you, you see there is a huge amount of work being done. How do you make that more efficient through e-platforms and so on and so forth? And yeah, that's that's incremental innovation. It's important, but at some point in three years or five years or whenever it is, we'll all be in the same place, essentially, yes. And everyone will get from database log to CSR to filing in five minutes flat. And you know, that'll be great. Uh, so yes, it's important and you must never lose sight of that stuff. But to me, how we you know, how we think about addressing patient needs more effectively, but doing it in an open-minded way that says we don't have the answers to start with, and whether that's through the development paradigm or whether that's once we actually have a drug for an indication and we have to think about what can we do more intelligently to bring that to more patients more effectively, that's where I see innovation. And in the past, we didn't do it in 2020, I guess, for obvious reasons, we have run innovation contests across Otsuka. And a couple of their defining characteristics are, you know, they are truly cross-functional. They your teams come from absolutely anywhere. And yeah, you, know, you see teams that you kind of kind of wonder at, you know, from pharmacovigilance and commercial and a couple of other places getting together, but they're around common interests and they're thinking about, you know, back to the fact that our system doesn't work. What can I do? to improve some aspect of this, some aspect of the patient experience. And we've had a number of ideas that have come forward from that, that we then fund and so on. In fact, much of the machine learning platform on which a lot of our algorithms are targeting and so on and so on is based, that came out of some work that a bunch of very smart people put together for the innovation competition a couple of years ago. Um, now, the cynical cynics would say, well, you could just have waited three years and then bought that off the shelf from <laughs> Salesforce or, or whoever it may be. But yeah. actually, that's the sort of innovation we love to encourage, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've got to want to see it. I, I just yep. posted something today about, the, you know, R Robert Koch and the, you know, attributed as a huge inventor and innovator in our time. But uh, the people in his lab that built the first Petri dish, you know, Mr. Petri, and the, and the woman that, that uh, developed the agar that went into the Petri dish are, you know, written out of history, despite right. being the huge enablers of everything that came, you know, uh, you know, t t t towards his discovery. So uh, I, I think, you know, that environment is, is, is fundamental. Um, so you, you clearly have, you know, a working definition that you apply internally and, uh, and, and, and drive. How does, how does your organization see so like Proteus Health? I mean, you had a you you, you leapt, you know, Otsuka leapt into that opportunity early and had a, I'm gonna say a bumpy ride. But you know, do, do you, you know, how do you see that in, in in retrospect? So I think we recognized some years ago that maybe technology and the intersection of technology and medicine could actually help us get to something that looks 
more like personalized medicine in psychiatry, or at least more tailored medicine and so on. And that's really been at the heart of, you know, when we started to work with Proteus, it was okay. So the ingestion of a sensor can tell you whether or not somebody's taken a medicine, but you know, that's fine at an individual level. The power of this is if you can truly get to population level and actually start to talk about, you know, not only can you adjust dose and so on for people because you know much more about how they're responding, but you can actually then start to segment and stratify within the population. So we were probably ahead of our time in that, or rather just the ability to drive novel technology through the entrenched workflows and so on in the system is really hard. So while we continue to look at that and we continue to look for ways to leverage that, as you know, we now own the technology outright, having bought it out of uh, bankruptcy last year. We've also done a lot of work around areas like digital therapeutics and increasingly around digital biomarkers and so on. And then, you know, I, I do believe in the next few years, the ability to integrate information, whether that's from digital therapeutics, from biomarkers, from sensors and so on, I think we will be in a much imaging as well, because there's a lot of advances in imaging as well um, within neuroscience, we will be in a much better place to start thinking about you know, what is you know, truly precision or targeted medicine for psychiatry. I think the other thing to say is you know, a digital therapeutic that actually improves symptoms is feasible in behavioral health. Um, it's you know not feasible in oncology or whatever probably, but you know in the yeah. area of behavioral health, you really can think about therapeutics that actually have an impact. And so we've been on that journey. We continue to be on that journey. Um, you will not be surprised to know that doing that from within a pharmaceutical company is extraordinarily hard. And mm -hmm. you know you talk to many many companies, and they will all tell you the same. These are fundamentally different paradigms. The tech paradigm and the drug development paradigm and bringing them together successfully is really hard. But I think unless you do it, you're never gonna learn how to do it. I think it's really interesting to, you know, there's a lot of conversations around that, that technology were around this being, you know, it's a totally true lesson for pharma that you can't go doing stuff that's mad and then, you know, uh, and then expect good things to happen. And they go, well, you've learned stuff that you couldn't possibly have done unless you did it. Exactly. In, in it to win it seems like a really uh, important part of innovation to me. Yeah. And and it takes time. I mean, I, I think that the other thing is, I mean, you never, I mean, first, you're never going to declare victory because you should always be learning, you should always be innovating, you should always be building on what you do. But you also don't know what the tipping point of the various different incremental innovations that you rely on is going to be. And I, you know, I, lots of people have been predicting that, you know, whether it's that integration of wearable sensors, you know, biomarkers and big data analytics and so on, that the tipping point is, you know, round the corner. Well, it's still round the corner yes, <laughs> in terms of actually how pharmaceutical companies turn that into revenue generation. Now, there are many other players around us who are able to generate revenues and have successful business models around parts of that. But I'm not aware of any pharmaceutical company that's really converted that into a revenue stream or a significant one yet. Yeah. And it's hard, isn't it? Because I think the uh, that, that question of, is it will it generate revenue? You know, we've been very lucky with the pharmaceutical model, but we, uh, you know, over the last 50 years, I guess the question is if everything has to be held to that level, it, you know, it becomes hard to, to, to say yes to new technologies. It, it, it does. Um, at the same time, hopefully some of the development costs are not the same as what we've spent on pharmaceutical yeah. development as well. And that's, yeah. and that, but you're exactly right. And, and yeah, we spend a lot of time, you know, educating ourselves and educating the world in general, you know, a single digital therapeutic is not going to be a, multi-billion dollar product um mm. you know you're going to have to build a portfolio and also i mean you know with a drug you tr once you've got it and arrived at a formulation that works you try not to touch it for 20 years yes <laughs> yeah an app by definition should be changing all the time yeah so again yeah. that comes back to the fact the paradigm is just completely different from yeah. the two uh, sides yeah. and with that you know and your ability to shape you know the organization do you you know do you you know I had a good conversation today about, you know, does, does function follow form or does form follow function in terms of, um, you know, organizational structure next to that kind of a thing? Do you, do you, how do you see maybe the next five years and in integrating that kind of thinking? So how we're currently thinking about it, but this may well evolve, is 
you know, what's important is there are obviously strengths from what we do within pharmacy rules, what we've learned to do, what we've done well, that we absolutely want to continue to leverage. So, you know, a, a you know, an understanding of psychiatry and understanding through medical affairs and so on. And some of the elements of development and regulatory interaction that we can argue how important the regulatory piece will be in the future. But we clearly need to graft in completely different skill sets, capabilities, ways of looking at the world and so on. So where we are currently is a, a relatively small group of different thinkers with a different background and a different way of doing things, loosely allied to specific points in the broader business. So specific points within commercial, within development, within regulatory, whose sole focus is around digital though, and those are anchor points for that now. You know, it's a it's a do it from within, but by f infusing completely new skills and capabilities. It also, frankly, will be an even more partnered model, I suspect, than the existing pharmaceutical business, because yeah, yeah, at the obvious level, when you know, I'm not going to hire a thousand programmers to actually write apps and so on. So yeah, from the trivial level of that, but so it's going to be a very partnered model. But it is about getting the right expertise, but then making sure it's connected. To some of the core disciplines of the business. You know, one of our challenges with the Proteus Alliance was, you know, in the last couple of years of that, we kind of probably made that too siloed as a digital medicine silo. And actually, they, for a bunch of reasons, and it doesn't take too much to imagine why the pharma organization decided, you know, they didn't want to deal with them. They found themselves too isolated from that. So that didn't work at that time. So I'm trying that something that's a little different now. Yeah, interesting. And um, you know, this I'm going to come back to the serendipity and the <laughs> and the pivoting and the range. Um, if you could do that all over again, would you pursue a more linear path, or do you, you know, the, you know, what, what have been the learnings that you would that you'd want to keep from that uh, from, from 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 that approach? So, I, I think, yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean. Part, I, I think a key part of the learning there was we didn't we didn't jointly work out which areas we really needed to optimize as opposed to trying to do everything okay. Yes, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. and digital medicine is complex. I mean, it's it's the sensor and the medicine, it's the app, it's every, I mean, there's a and mm -hmm. you know, so it's all the way from manufacturing through and so on. So it's a pretty complex value chain and so on. And I think determining what we needed to optimize, what we could have partnered and so on. Now. All that's wonderful in hindsight. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that anyone sitting back in 14 or 15 or 16 could have necessarily chosen to do it differently. But to your point, the lessons are what we take when we do things differently in future. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. exactly what we're going to do. And I think, you know, there are some around that. I, I think the organizational piece is also really important around what we do there and so on. And then, you know, which I think is becoming increasingly interesting, which is, you know, clearly, you know, part of what drives software is you know, the concept, you put it out there, you put it out there in beta and let people play with it and so on. Now, you know, we, we're obviously not going to do doing that with drugs anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we, you know, as we look at some of the areas like digital therapeutics and so on we're doing, how do we get to that kind of that marriage between, you know, what a software company can do, what a pharma company knows how to do and so on and do it that way? How How do we actually really do a much better job of rapid experimentation that builds a better product because that is how software works yes um, yeah. yeah yeah i mean personally i think that's how pharmaceutical development works as well but it's a, <laughs> it's uh yeah i think it's a really interesting point um and i think the and i've also been interested because you also have japan you know, you know, which a lot of people have more, you know, geographic, uh, so 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 focus. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested. In maybe generalize on how a Japanese farmer thinks and works, and you know whether that's a, an enabler or a barrier to to innovation. So, in our case, it's clearly been an enabler, kind of writ large. And uh, and I'd say a couple of things here. I mean, Otsuka is a public company, but in many ways behaves like a private company. And what I mean by that is in terms of, you know, extended timelines, a sense, you know, and we, we joke about it, but it 
isn't actually a joke. We joke about being in business forever, about you know the 300 year strategy and so on. Um, which is not to say shareholders are not important, but it's not around the quarterly earnings. That really is not a driver. Um, so that's one element. I think Otsukas is also interesting because while pharmaceuticals is our primary business, we are actually a broader healthcare business. We have what we call nutraceuticals business, but it's things like vitamins and so on. So we have a we already have a more all-encompassing view of healthcare as a whole. It's not just driven by pharma. So within the Otsuka context, you know, acknowledge, acknowledging the role that technology can play in life and so on, that, that's absolutely understood. I think Japan itself is interesting because, you know, and again, without, don't want to resort to cliches, but I think we, we, we all, I mean, Japan has extraordinary record of technology and technology advance, not always translated into commercial success or building commanding businesses around it sometimes. But not always, and you know it's been interesting to see that even in the pandemic, because actually people's ability to work from home, in terms of connectivity, in terms of frankly even the systems we use in the office, was much less in Japan than in some other parts of the world. So you know, despite being extraordinarily advanced, one of the richest countries on earth, yeah, how that translates into everyday life yeah. was somewhat different. Yeah, and we saw that with the Olympics, right? I mean, uh, yep. it, was, it was a surprise to learn how fully vaccinated the, the sort of population of Tokyo was. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. So, if you could, um, you know, if you could wave a magic wand over pharma and biotech, and, and have it behave differently, or, or you know, are, are there things that you would, you know, would come to mind easily, or you know, that would, would get us more of the great medicines, you know, faster? Yeah, so I, I, I think a couple of things, and I'm sure everyone who works, particularly on the commercial side of pharma, will tell you this. We need to, yeah, how we approach early stage development needs to change. And there, there are a couple of different ways. I mean, one, I think, and I know I'm preaching the choir and talking to you on this, but I mean, obviously, being much more open minded about where a molecule can go is, is part of it, at the same time as being much quicker to stop it going somewhere that's actually going to generate no value at all. Yes. Um, so that, 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 that both of those would need to change, um, you know, and all of us can point to examples of drugs that, you know, have been studied for indications long after it was clear there was no value in it. So mm. I, I think another, and I think we're all getting better at this, but is exactly that while being very open-minded about where the molecule is going to take you, making sure that you do have as good an understanding you can of where the environment's going to be in three, five, seven, ten years' time, and so on. And I think one of the exciting things, for instance, in neuroscience is, you know, from a period even five years ago where there weren't that many people doing new interesting things, we're now at a period where there are lots of people doing new interesting things. That's great for patients and so on, but also means you've got to be, frankly, more brutal about what you stop doing because somebody else may get there first. Um, so that's a couple of areas. I, I think, and again, uh, I know that you know every U.S. commercial organization in pharma that I know of is going through the same. I mean, we there is clearly a recognition that how we have been successful commercially for the last 20, 30, 40 years is not going to be sufficient in future. Um, and, and again, I think everyone's familiar with the drivers of that. You know, 10 years ago, you still had many individual prescribers making their own decisions. Now, the vast majority are part of systems where decision making is moving to different places and so on. And while, you know, the, the, the account manager prescriber relationship remains important, the idea that that is the principal determinant of prescribing and commercial success that's clearly not tenable even today, and that's going to change also significantly over time. And I think you will see a lot of change on the commercial model in the US in particular in the years to come too. Do you think COVID has been a spur for that change? Absolutely. Or, yeah. I mean, I think you know the yeah the fact that we have had to leverage technology to talk to our customers, but also that pres prescribers and patients are using technology to work with each other now. Yeah, that got to a pretty advanced level, particularly in psychiatry. It's come back from that a bit, but absolutely, I think that. And then just the, you know, the fact that you know, there are obviously zillions of ways to convey information to prescribers that do not depend on an in-person face-to-face call. Mm -hmm. And how do we appropriately 
utilize those and how do we coordinate those so that we actually create you know a, an efficient and an effective way to work with our customers hmm. interesting um i want to switch a little bit to you know Kabir. um you know when monday morning comes around what is it that drives you you know as an individual what drives you personally so uh, working I mean, working in this industry is amazing and you know doing what we do is amazing we there are a couple of things i mean as an organization we defined our purpose last year which is we defy limitations so that others can too and that's important to me you know like many people you know mental health mental illness has you know serious personal um interest for me you know i've had you know, within family and friends and so on so and i'm acutely conscious of the fact that we could do much more um, to bring better outcomes to patients. So that drives me. Um, but yes, the sense that, you know, uh, we also say, you know, we will not rest till the value of every mind is realized. And that really does drive us. And I really believe that. So that's, that will get me here on a Monday morning, though. You know, sometimes the thought of the 14 hour days with a call with Japan at night is, is not the most encouraging on a Monday morning. <laughs> But it is, it's, it's interesting that you mention it because it's something I often find is missing from, you know, former executives that, you know, they'll complain about not, not having business class travel and they'll complain about a bunch of other things. And so you do realize you're working on a cure for cancer or, <laughs> or, working, or, or working on something that will change people's lives fundamentally. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, and I think often those personal connections are, you know, very important you know, reminders of why you turn up to work and, and do the 40 nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and, and you know, honestly, I mean, that's why I think, you know, it, I feel privileged and lucky to work in this place because, you know, unfortunately, all of us know somebody with some form of, you know, issue, hopefully not serious, but some sort of issue with mental health, mental wellness, you know, whether that's friends, family, colleagues, and so on. And it, what's interesting, I mean, we, took the opportunity last year and into this year to really try and open that dialogue up even within the company, because it probably won't surprise you to know that even in a company focused on psychiatry, there is a taboo about talking about your own personal struggles with mental illness. And we've managed to start to break that this year. But even for us, that's been a challenge. Interesting. No, I'm not surprised. I remember doing a survey at a company that was an, an epilepsy company and they were unaware of how many people who worked within their organization knew or had epilepsy and it was it right. was one of those things you go well it's, it's it's quite an interesting thing to do uh, you know to connect that absolutely that with, uh, with with the purpose as well so yeah. um, that's, that's very interesting um, do you think the future in psychiatry especially neuroscience will become more about precision or you know, because I know there's been this long conversation about the sort of fifties and sixties as golden period for, 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 you know, for psychiatry drugs. Do you, do you think we'll get a golden period back? I think we could. I mean, I think, so I think a couple of things. I mean, I think in certainly in, as you go into some areas of neurodegeneration and so on, you're clearly looking at actually potentially gene therapies and some target therapy, but I think within psychiatry, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I do think the ability to integrate yeah, you know, digital approaches, including biomarkers, sensors, I think the ability to look at patterns that may therefore enable you to at least have some predictability around episodes and so on, I think that will be the case. I, I also think just the range of options is going to increase. And, you know, again, it's no secret, Utsuka is interested in psychedelics. You know, we were actually an investor. We are an investor in Compass Pathways. Um, we are looking at a number of other areas of that. And I think you know, thanks to Janssen for breaking through with ketamine. But I think, you know, now as we look, whether it's psilocybin, MDMA, or a number of these other synthetic things. And again, you know, how we how we identify the appropriate patients for that and so on has to be a key part of that journey. But I'm excited about the potential to bring some of those new options also to patients in the years to come. And even maybe to redefining, you know, what it you know what a therapeutic is because i think you know in, in so many of those cases the the kind of guided experience is, is, is you know and the, and the service is at least as much a part of the, Absolutely. the outcome uh and maybe to redefining you know ego and, and a bunch of other things in, in, in those diseases so it's uh i think the, the compass thing is very very exciting um so 
I always ask about books, you know, uh, first of all, do you get time to read? And if you get time to read, or do, do you have recommendations for, for us? No, well, it's, it's funny. So I actually, I mean, I, I, ironic that it sounds, I probably read less now just because of I don't have the monthly trip to Japan. So there was something about, you know, 28 hours in a plane yeah, <laughs> every month yeah. and the odd yeah. trip to Europe and so that gave me time. But no, yeah. I do try and read and so on. And I try and read kind of some of it around work and so on. So, um, you know, and you know, there are so many books you can read around psychiatry, mental illness mm -hmm. and so on. But, you know, um, a couple that are, that are interesting. There's a book by, uh, Randy Ness, who's a well-known psychiatrist and one of the founders of kind of evolutionary psychology, psychiatry, good reasons for bad feelings, which you know is applying some of the principles of evolutionary biology to psychiatry. You know, and trying to answer the fundamental question of you know why didn't natural selection get rid of schizophrenia and MDD and bipolar disorder and so on? Because what useful function can they serve? And yeah. fascinating, you know, it's not necessarily settled or agreed science but is a very interesting different lens on that because yeah. that's a question to really ask yeah um so that's something that i you know i think for people interested in the space is interesting yeah we also have, are doing work you know we have a, a separate charitable foundation i mentioned earlier you know the the criminalization of mental illness in the u.s in particular is a huge issue um there's a book by an author called elisa roth which um you know, is really a, around that, which is around, you know, the way we treat people with mental illness in hospitals, in jails, and so on in the US. And that's powerful and shocking. And again, something that, you know, as a wake up call for, you know, some of us know something about it, lots of people know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. And the other one I was going to say, which is completely different. So I try and read biographies and, you know, some other nonfiction. There's a relatively new biography of Keynes out, um, which okay. is interesting, which, you know, a lot of the stories are kind of, you know, well known and so on, but l really looking at how people are built on Keynesian thought and so on since he died. It's kind of interesting at a time when you could argue that the US with its whatever it is, one to three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill. I mean, that's in some ways kind of a classic Keynesian reflation. Um, so, yeah, a couple couple of interesting things there. That's a wonderful range. Now, actually, on the uh, criminalization, I remember reading Robert Sapolsky's book, Behave, on the uh, you know, how epilepsy was considered as a sort of psychiatric disorder for a long right. time. Right. And, you know, and, and shunned for, 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 for that reason. So it's, it's right. interesting. Um, so probably the last question, the uh, second last question, you know, what, what, what are your ambitions for the next five years for, for, for you uh, and, and, and what you can get done? So... I, I think there are a, a couple of things. I mean, I think first, you know, I, I know that this is, you know, what we're trying to do is a journey. I know it's a, a, a journey that, you know, there's no destination as such, but I firmly believe that over the next few years, we will be able to bring to market new indications and new solutions for people with serious mental illness. I mean, I think the other is, you know, I actually do have two roles. I run the U.S., but I'm also uh, responsible for the global pharmaceutical business within Otsuka. Um, obviously, that's been hard for the last 18 months because it's hard to run businesses across the world, particularly in Asia from here. But I think increasingly, you know, globalizing some of our capabilities, particularly on the commercial, the market access and so on side. But above all, just continuing to learn and continuing to grow as a leader. You know, I've grown a lot as a leader in the last year. I'm definitely more authentic, more vulnerable, more connected to everyone in the organization than I was in March last year. And I look forward to continue on that journey too. Interesting. And do you think, sorry, I'm inserting a question before my last one. Uh, do you think we'll go back to, you know, full-time, you know, headquarter type businesses, or do you think there might be a more distributed model? There has to be a more distributed model. It's just not, um, you know, uh, I'm sitting here in Princeton, New Jersey. You know, two years ago, I might have said to somebody from Cambridge, you need to relocate. It's not exactly credible today to say to somebody who's living in Cambridge or Boston, you had to relocate to New Jersey or whatever. So I think there's that. Second, we have to recognize there are many roles. You know, I, look, I, the face-to-face -face piece is incredibly important and we are encouraging people to come back. And people working strategically in marketing and medical and commercial, all these, yes, they absolutely need to interact from time to time and so on. But we also had to recognize that the person whose job is posting general ledger accounts or whatever probably doesn't need to be doing that.
from Princeton, from an expensive office in Princeton if they don't need to. So it's going to be something much more hybrid. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because it, it feels like the conversation about outsourcing 10 years ago, doesn't it? And that's exactly. a sense that, you know, why would you need to have it in Basel or, yep. or Berlin if it could be somewhere else? Um, the last question is a very simple one. You know, I, I've asked you some questions, but I, I, you've got a lot to, 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 to give. Are there any questions that you wish I'd asked you before we close? No, I th- Mike, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think uh, no, we've covered a lot of ground. And as you said, we're never quite sure where it's going to go, but I've, I've very much enjoyed it. Thank you. No, it's it, it's it, it's been interesting to watch the you know and say personal observation is the kind of humanity of Otsuka in the in the in in the pharma space. You know, it feels like a very human company when you whenever you you, you turn up. So it's uh, you know uh, you know, kudos to to, to you and uh, and yours for 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 for, for, for that. So um, no, thank you for taking the time out to to talk with us. Um, if people want to find you, is it easy to find you? Yeah, absolutely on LinkedIn. Um, I do have a Twitter handle, but I'm very discreet about that because I know that somebody from corporate affairs will come down like a ton on bricks on the effect. <laughs> yeah, you're not quite an Elon Musk. So no, no. You can write whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fantastic. Um, Kabir, it's been a real pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for the invitation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm-hmm.